So I do have quite a few slides. I was trying to uh, keep it to less than 40, but I haven't managed to do that. So I'm going to try and go through um, as many slides as I can. The first few slides mainly relate to um, child health and child nutrition because I wasn't sure how many people here would have had or would have a background on child health. Um, so I put them in um, and then we move on to the HIV stuff. So please bear with me if you already know uh, all the child health stuff. So the question is, why, why should we talk about child survival, HIV, and infant feeding? Why not just HIV and infant feeding? And I think what we've come to realize is that when we talk about child survival, in this current environment, we really want to speak about HIV-free survival. So we want children who are free of HIV and who have healthy, good quality lives whenever we measure the outcome. And we've also come to realize that nutrition plays a very critical role then in child survival. And people may have seen this um, diagram before that looks at the relationship between inadequate dietary intake, uh, weight loss, growth faltering, lowering of immunity, mucosal damage, leading to disease, leading to appetite loss, and then the whole cycle again, which many people have called the malnutrition and infection cycle. Some people go further to link it to poverty because that's what we're really speaking about. It's poverty, malnutrition, altered immunity, disease, uh, malnutrition, and the cycle continues. So it's really quite a vicious cycle of malnutrition and infection. And when one looks at HIV, we realize that in the context of HIV then, adults or children with HIV then face uh, a double burden of having HIV with the immune impairments that it brings with it, uh, which lead to infectious disease, malnutrition, and the whole cycle continues with HIV and then with additional infections that come in intercurrently. So as David mentioned earlier, we've spoken about infant feeding previously, and many people may have heard lots of talks about it. We've had previous dilemmas about how to feed infants who are born to HIV-positive women. Um, and you may have always seen these scales that we present. <laughs> so the scales mean that we've really got to weigh up the risk. The risk of or weigh up the, the issues for that particular child. Uh, in the first place, we want to protect the child from HIV transmission. But in the second place, we want to protect the child from morbidity and mortality from infectious diseases. And that's the dilemma that people have always uh, represented as, uh, as uh, imbalances on a scale. Um, and what modeling has shown is that when there are no effective antiretroviral drugs, then abstinence from breastfeeding may actually result in equivalent outcomes to, br to uh, outcomes with breastfeeding, okay? But there was a lot of controversy about that because it depended on what the background infant mortality rate was, depended on what the profile of disease is for that particular area, depended on the socioeconomic circumstances for that area. So there was really no one size fits all. Um, and that has really posed a dilemma and caused a lot of confusion. Um, if I look back from approximately 1999 till late last year, and there are people who still dispute several issues on this topic. So I think what we know is that when we look at infant feeding, morbidity, and mortality, that we, we've come across or we privy now to quite a lot of information. The most recent information comes from the Lancet Nutrition Series, which was published in 2008, and I'm not sure if Many of you have seen the papers in the nutrition series. But what that actually showed is the relative risk of various feeding patterns compared with exclusive breastfeeding amongst various groups of children. So if we look at all-cause mortality, diarrhea mortality, and pneumonia mortality, what the papers show us is that with not breastfeeding, there is really a very high increased risk of adverse outcomes, be it all-cause mortality, so not breastfeeding is the yellow bar, so <coughs> very high relative risk of all-cause mortality, diarrhea mortality, and pneumonia mortality um, if a child does not breastfeed. And you'll see that the risks are much less if a child practices or 
if a child is given partial breastfeeding or predominant breastfeeding. Now there is a difference between partial and predominant breastfeeding. Uh, partial breastfeeding means that the infant is given breast milk plus other liquids which might be nutritive or non-nutritive, okay? Whereas predominant breastfeeding means that the infant is given breast milk plus other liquids, but those liquids that the infant is given is non-nutritive, okay? So if you have a baby who's being fed breast milk plus formula milk, formula milk is nutritive, so they would fall into the partial breastfeeding group, okay? And one would notice that there is a difference between babies who are partially breastfed versus predominantly breastfed. So that was summarized in the Lancet Nutrition Series, but there are several other papers on this topic, okay? Now this is for the general population, not necessarily for HIV infected or HIV exposed infants in particular, okay? So that's the most recent bit of information. Then we had the Lancet Child Survival Series in 2003, so this was from the Lancet Nutrition Series and in white is the Lancet Child Survival Series, and that also looked at modeling, and what they found is that breastfeeding, a high coverage of any breastfeeding, can prevent up to 13% of childhood mortality, and they compared that to nevirapine plus formula feeding, which was the only intervention available at that time, and found that nevirapine plus replacement feeding could prevent about 2% of childhood deaths. Okay, so that's where that's information that we got from the Lancet Child Survival Series. And then way back in 2000, there was the WHO collaborative study that showed the relative risk of mortality from infectious diseases amongst breastfed, amongst non-breastfed infants. And you'll find that the relative risks are quite high, and these are compared to breastfeeding infants. So we do have lots of information from previous or prior to the HIV era, showing us the risks of not breastfeeding or the risks of partial breastfeeding. Okay, so that's for the general population. So what I'm going to cover today, so that was just to set the scene to say that's where we are and that's what we know. And I'm now going to try and cover several issues starting from, so where are we with child health in South Africa? I then want to move on to HIV in South Africa. I then want to focus on feeding in the general population because I think that message often gets uh, neglected or forgotten. Um, although we have a high HIV prevalence in South Africa, the majority of women are still HIV negative and we would like to keep them negative. I then want to focus on postnatal HIV transmission and this is quite a long section, quite a number of slides. Uh, in the next two sections on postnatal HIV transmission and then the new information on HIV and breastfeeding. And then summary and just a few recommendations and I think I'll also put forward some of my thoughts uh, about where we should be going to from here. So just to look at child health in South Africa, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have seen these reports that come out, the Every Death Counts, there's the Saving Mothers report, the Saving Babies report, um, and then the CHIP reports. Um, but these provide quite a lot of information um, and help us to see how we're doing as a country towards meeting some of the child health goals that we have. Now one of the, the main goals that we're looking at at the moment is the fourth millennium development goal and that is to reduce the under five mortality rates by two thirds by 2015. Um, it's a goal that was set in 1990 um, and the top line in orange, that is an orange up there, um, shows us where the under five mortality rate is at the present moment. It's estimated to be at 67, um, and where the target is, which is 20. Okay, so we're quite far away from the target. Um, there are various estimates. I've just shown you one here of the under five mortality rate, um, which is in orange, but there are various um, estimates that people use. In summary, they differ a little bit, uh, but in summary, they all show us that we're not really on track to meet the fourth millennium development goal. Okay, so some might say under five mortality rate of 67, some might say 80, some might say 85, but in general, the main take home message, it depends on who's done the modeling and what assumptions they've made. Um, but in general, the general message is that as a country, we're not on track to meet the fourth millennium development goal. 
This was also explained in the Every Death Counts um, paper that was published by The Lancet in 2008. And the question that they asked was, why do children and newborns die in South Africa? And this is what they came up with. So as a country, um, we have a high burden of <coughs> HIV. And so the finding was that approximately 35% of uh, childhood deaths were attributed to HIV. Then there's a whole chunk that's attributable to neonatal causes, and that's broken down even further by infection, uh, preterm delivery, or birth asphyxia. Um, and then there's pneumonia. We always knew that lower respiratory tract infections contributed towards a lot of mortality. Um, so it's pneumonia, diarrhea, sepsis and meningitis, um, other child illnesses and injuries. So in summary, you can see that the bulk of our deaths, if we take children and newborns together, the bulk of the deaths are due to HIV, AIDS and newborn causes. Okay? And then pneumonia, diarrhea, sepsis contribute about 18 or 19 percent to that mortality. So that's, uh, that's where we are in terms of our mortality. So what do we know about the services that we offer? And how does that translate into provincial profiles of morbidity and mortality? So if we look at our national immunization coverage since 1994, um, what we find is that the general trend is that coverage has decreased. Um, there could be various reasons due to that. Some of them could be methodological relating to how we actually count these numbers because they're mainly based on the the health information system, which is not always accurate, but it does provide us with some kind of understanding of what's happening. So the trend that we find um, using the same method uh, or similar method from 94 till now is that the immunization coverage is decreasing. And then we find that, this is also from the Every Death Counts article, we find that if we look at ever breastfed, Many children are ever best breastfed in South Africa. So this is the general population again. So approximately 85 to 88% of children are ever breastfed. Um, the coverage of the first immunization seems to still be sitting at around 80%. Um, but children fully immunized, which is EPI one year, is slightly less than that. Um, mother's knowledge of oral rehydration therapy is much lower, so a basic child health care service or a basic life-saving intervention. Um, not many mothers know how to do that, uh, just about 50%. And vitamin A coverage is still quite low. If we looked at something like exclusive breastfeeding, we spoke about breastfeeding previously, that it can be a child survival intervention. It does prevent against morbidity and mortality. Um, you saw the relative risks that were presented. If we look at something like exclusive breastfeeding less than six months, we find that coverage is much, much lower. Um, DHIS puts it, or the, the Demographic Health Survey puts it at approximately 10% of children uh, aged zero to three months um, in 1998 and 12% in 2003. So that's really very low for uh, an intervention that, that can be so life-saving for children. What the Every Death Count reports also do is they look at what are the modifiable factors or are there modifiable factors to prevent childhood deaths. And what they found after going through the information is that 25% of modifiable factors relate to the family or community and that mainly relates to delay in treatment seeking. Okay, so at that point in the household, who makes the decision to say that this child must go to hospital or must seek care? so about 25% are due to that. 22% are related to administrator action, for example, no senior doctor or nurse uh, on the premises or insufficient beds for children, um, so health system related issues. And then 53% are related to healthcare provider actions, for example, um, no specific guidelines uh, available at that point in time at that clinic or at that center, uh, or poor assessment and management in hospital, okay? Um, so that was just to give you a brief background of child health in South Africa and where we are. So I now want to focus on HIV in South Africa, and I think many of you know a lot about HIV in South Africa, so I'm not going to go through that in, a great uh, in detail at all. Just to show you the HIV prevalence amongst pregnant women since 1990, um, and I think 
most people must have seen the antenatal survey or heard of the results, um, the most recent results. Um, the HIV prevalence nationally was put at 29% with a range from 16 to 39%. And that's important for us when we talk about child health because it tells us um, that the proportion of children who could be HIV exposed. Okay, and you see that it is an upward trend. Seems to be starting to plateau and that could be due to various reasons, including deaths. Just to remind us that um, a large proportion, at least 35% of childhood deaths could be attributable to um, HIV infection. So the slide after that was to, sh to give you some of the provincial profiles. So looking at two provinces, the Western Cape and uh, Limpopo province, um, so that you have some idea of what the, the mortality, uh, the, what, the, uh, what the causes of childhood deaths are in those specific provinces. Uh, you can see that in those two particular provinces, um, HIV infection does account for about 45% of deaths, no, 25%. But if you um, add up the deaths due to uh, infectious diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea, um, congenital infections uh, and newborn infections, they actually seem to then... Um, account for more deaths than HIV. But it was just to give you an idea to say what are the main causes of under five mortality and how does that link with what we're seeing in the adult population where HIV prevalence is rising. Obviously they're more HIV exposed children and so we need to take heed of that. Um, the question then arises, so given this picture that we have in South Africa of the current state of services with not uh, optimal coverage of immunization with a high HIV prevalence. Um, what do we do about feeding in general? And I want to cover feeding in general first. So what we currently say is that for HIV negative women or for women of unknown HIV status, exclusive breastfeeding should be practiced for the first six months of life with continued breastfeeding thereafter for up to two years. That's what the WHO UNICEF recommendations speak about. And complementary foods should be introduced from about six months. Why breastfeeding and why exclusive breastfeeding? We all know that breast milk has lots of uh, constituents, that colostrum, which is the very first milk, which lots of people and lots of cultures still think should be thrown away because uh, it looks dirty. Um, is antibody rich, it has lots of white blood cells, um, it can actually be the baby's first immunization, it can be a purgative because it helps to clear meconium, um, it has lots of growth factors so it helps to mature the intestine and in doing that it helps to prevent allergy, um, either um, in the shorter term or in the long term. Um, it's also rich in vitamin A. We also know, and I'm sure many of us heard, um, when we did our undergraduate training that there are many advantages to breastfeeding, that it's easily digested, um, that it helps with bonding, it helps delay a mother's pregnancy. So there are several reasons about why we're saying breastfeeding. We also know from the previous slides that I showed you that breastfeeding is associated with uh, protection from common diseases. We saw that in the WHO 2000 study, which is on the right-hand side. We saw that again in the, the Lancet modeling that they did in 2003 where breastfeeding was supposed to or is supposed to prevent about 13% of deaths worldwide. Um, and we saw it in the Lancet nutrition series. So this is just a reminder. And the question is why do we say exclusive breastfeeding? And we say exclusive breastfeeding mainly so that we can take advantage of the, the protective factors and the growth factors in breast milk, okay? So once something else, something foreign enters the gut, it then disrupts that, um, that cycle and that growth that's been happening or that is scheduled to happen, then facilitates the entry of um, allergens, of bacteria, of viruses. Um, and so it leads to something that people are now recognizing, something called leaky gut, okay? And that's, that's why. So the question always arises is, is exclusive breastfeeding possible? Um, and I think that that's a question that many people ask. 
Um, some believe that it's something unfeasible. Um, not many people achieve it, and not many countries have achieved it. Um, we have very limited data on exclusive breastfeeding. Um, in South Africa, I mentioned that in 1998, the Demographic Health Survey found that our exclusive breastfeeding rates uh, for children aged 0 to 3 was about 10%, which is very low. Um, although, as you saw, about at least 80% of women initiate breastfeeding, okay? Um, and now, uh, in 2003, our rates are supposed to be at 12%, and the HSRC study last year put our rates at about 25%, um, which is likely to be an overestimate just because of the way they asked the question. So we're sitting at, let's say, between 12 and 20%, okay? Um, this is data from Hlavisa, which is a rural area in KZN. Uh, many people may have heard about it. The Africa Center for Health and Population Studies is located there. And the study, the vertical transmission study by Prof Kovadia and his team was conducted in Hlavisa um, or in that district. So this is data from there. Um, they had a very intensive breastfeeding support program, um, which involved peer counselors, so not nurses, but peer counselors, women from the community who were trained and mentored um, on breastfeeding, um, who went to visit mothers in their homes. And using that very intense system of support, they managed to increase their exclusive breastfeeding rates um, to 80, almost 82% at six weeks, 66% at about three months, and then 40% at six months, okay? So this is in a South African context with a lot of support. Yes, we can achieve some increase in exclusive breastfeeding rates. This is then also very interesting because it shows, so the Hlabisa one was a district-wide intervention or it happened in a district. This is data from Brazil, who as you know, is very similar to South Africa. Um, and it shows, you, it shows us their exclusive breastfeeding rates. Um, in 1986, 1991, 1996, and then between 2003 and 2008. Um, so it increased from approximately 3.7% in 1986 um, to about 40% in 2008. And the question that we should ask then is, what did they do as a country to increase their exclusive breastfeeding rates? And there's a very interesting paper by Quinn um, and what he looked at several countries, three countries that have increased their exclusive breastfeeding rates and found that what they really did was adopt what he called a multi-pronged strategy where they had political commitment to breastfeeding. They appointed somebody at a national level to then champion uh, breastfeeding. Um, they then, uh, depending on the countries, they then had similar people working in each province or each state, whatever it was called, in the country that uh, he was examining. Um, and they did intensive support, counseling, tutoring for people who were working with children and working with mothers. And through that intervention, they managed to increase breastfeeding rates. So this didn't involve home visits. It was mainly facility-based support. Um, which is a bit different from what the Hlabisa study was about because that one was mainly intense home visits, okay? So this was uh, at a facility level. Other people have found um, that it is possible to increase exclusive feeding rates, be it breastfeeding or formula feeding. Um, remember that for HIV positive mothers, we were saying at one stage that they should avoid breastfeeding if they can. So other studies have found that it is possible for women to exclusively breastfeed, either um, exclusively breastfeed in the first six months of life, or it could be possible with support for women to avoid breastfeeding um, totally. And with good support, uh, studies in Mexico have found that exclusive breastfeeding rates have gone up to 67%, in Bangladesh to 79%, and Mexico and Bangladesh those were both uh, community-based interventions involving home visits. The Peru and Bolivia experiences were uh, facility-based interventions at a population level. They got their rates up to 70%. There are also common concerns about exclusive breastfeeding, and I'm putting this up here because I think many of us deal with women who have these concerns. Um, not enough milk is very, very a very common concern, <coughs> and I think um, it stems from a lack of knowing or understanding how milk is produced and that lack of 
knowledge might be on the side of the mother or sometimes on the side of the health worker as well. So I think the common message for that is that the baby actually controls how much milk is produced most of the time. There are very few instances or very few exceptions. Um, so the more baby suckles, the more milk will be produced. The other belief is that colostrum is dirty or poisonous, and I know particularly in KZN and other parts of the country like Limpopo, many women want to throw away the colostrum, or many, it's a cultural tradition because it's believed that it's dirty or it's poisonous. And colostrum is actually rich, it's the, almost like the baby's first immunization if a baby's put to the breast before they receive their, their routine BCG and polio. Um, people often believe that the baby needs cleaning out and for that they get various uh, medications such as umutiwenyoni or gripe water. Um, and for that I think we need to try and um, acknowledge beliefs, um, not criticize them if they're not harmful, but also explain the benefits of breast milk to, to women and their partners or grandmothers or whoever is the decision maker in that family when it comes to feeding. Um, so breast milk actually helps cleanse, cleanse the baby because it helps, uh, it's a purgative and it helps meconium to be expelled. Um, many people think that the baby's thirsty, so the baby needs water, especially in summer, especially in the Northern Cape when it's very hot. Lots of babies need to drink lots of water because it's so hot. But the truth is that breast milk actually has two parts. There's the foremilk and the hind milk. The foremilk is the watery part and that quenches the thirst. And the hind milk then is the fat rich part, so it's rich in fat. So if, as common practice dictated in the past, if we tell mothers to breastfeed for five minutes from one breast and then five minutes from the other, the baby's only going to get four milk. So that baby's not going to be satisfied and they're going to cry because they're not getting enough, which is true because they're not getting the hind milk. So the main message now is to breastfeed for as long as possible from one side until the mother feels that most of her milk has been drained and then switch to the other side. There's also a common belief that a mother's breasts will sag because of breastfeeding, but actually pregnancy is the culprit for that. Um, so there's several cultural and other beliefs um, that then prevent exclusive breastfeeding. And I think as practitioners interested in child health, we need to know how to address these. Um, without slamming any of the traditional practices, but to add to the knowledge of the family or the mother or the decision maker. How do we support mothers to breastfeed? And I'll come back to this right at the end. It's really trying to listen and learn and build a mother's confidence so that she believes that she can breastfeed or exclusively breastfeed. And I won't go into details about that. So now I'll go into the main part of the presentation, which I think you're probably interested in. Um, and that is postnatal HIV transmission and what do, the, what do the new studies show? So I think many people may have seen a slide like this in the past. Um, and it, what it really says is that if there are 100 HIV, if there are 100 infants born to HIV, 100 HIV positive mothers, then in the absence of interventions, 32 of these babies will become infected with HIV if mothers do not receive any PMTCT intervention. And 20 of these 32 will be infected <coughs> in utero and peripartum. So this is in the absence of interventions. Okay, so now we're going back to the 1990s. Okay, and 12 through mixed breastfeeding. And 68 babies will remain uninfected. Okay, this is often a misconception, especially when, uh, when it comes to undergraduate students, because a lot of them believe that all babies will be infected. With single-dose nevirapine and exclusive breastfeeding for six months, so single-dose nevirapine was our previous regimen. Um, and I think in large parts of the country it still is used because there are no supplies of the current regimens. So um, I think Gauteng is a lot better than the other provinces. Uh, but in Limpopo and the Eastern Cape, people are still grappling with supplies. So about a third of women still get single-dose nevirapine. So with single-dose nevirapine, about 10 infants will be infected in utero and about five through exclusive breastfeeding for five months, or for six months, sorry. Okay, so exclusive breastfeeding, um, that works out to 5%. Um, so about 85 babies will remain uninfected. Okay, so we've increased that from 68 to 85 with the two interventions, single-dose nevirapine and exclusive breastfeeding for six months. So in the, in the absence of interventions, 
of those infants who become HIV positive, what factors are associated with transmission? And in the past, we always said that about 25% of transmission occurs um, during labor and delivery. And we said that about 35 to 40% of the transmission occurs during breastfeeding. So now we're talking about the denominators change, and so people often get confused. So now we're talking about of those babies who get HIV, okay, whereas the previous slide was looking at the, the population of HIV positive mothers and how many of their babies will get HIV. Now we're looking at of these babies who get HIV, when will they get it? Okay, so it's slightly different. Um, so we've often said during labor and delivery, about 25% uh, of transmission occurs then, and then 35 to 45 during, or 35 to 40 during breastfeeding. Obviously, as we improve our interventions uh, during pregnancy and during labor and delivery, the, the proportion of HIV infections attributable to pregnancy or to transmission during pregnancy and labor and delivery will decrease because we're improving our antenatal and intrapartum interventions. But the contribution that breastfeeding would then make to HIV infections would then rise. We know that there are several risk factors, so that's why I'm concentrating now on breast milk transmission, because we know that our regimens are improving, and we, we, we seeming to take care of the antenatal and the intrapartum uh, transmission. Okay? So what are the risk factors then associated with breast milk transmission? Um, and there are several, and I I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. So it's maternal seroconversion or infection during breastfeeding because the assumption is that the viral load will spike. Okay, A longer duration of breastfeeding because, as we know, breast milk without any prophylaxis, so just breast milk alone, carries HIV, Okay, and that can then enter into um, a baby, causing the transmission from mother to child. Um, so the longer you breastfeed for, the longer is the risk of the transmission. Um, a lower maternal CD4 count or a really sick mother, a mother with AIDS, mastitis, um, a higher uh, viral load um, in the blood and a higher viral load in breast milk, which will automatically, usually automatically occur, and then type of feeding. And we also know that most postnatal transmission occurs amongst mothers with a low CD4 cell count, okay? Which is why it's great that our new protocol, I think, uh, I think everyone's probably aware of the new protocol. Our new protocol says that we now treat mothers who have a CD4 count of 350 or less. So I now want to look at um, the issue of postnatal transmission and what we've learned from several studies along the line. So one of the risk factors for transmission is the pattern of breastfeeding. Is it exclusive or is it mixed? Okay, Mixed breastfeeding, as we said before, could be partial or it could be predominant. Partial means that the infant has received breast milk plus liquids which might be nutritive and non-nutritive. Okay, So that's partial. Predominant means that the infant has received breast milk plus liquids which are non-nutritive. And non-nutritive liquids might be weak tea, it might be glucose water, those are what we term non-nutritive. So the first study that people have probably heard about is a study by Anna Kutsudis, which was published um, around about 2001. And that was the first study to show that exclusive breastfeeding carried a lower risk of transmission than mixed feeding. Okay? Um, this was a vitamin A trial, so it was met with a lot of... Um, uh, there were many questions around the validity of the results. Okay. The second uh, study that was published was around about 2005. It was also a vitamin A trial um, by Peter Illiff in Zimbabwe, um, and they did their analysis also post hoc. They did their vitamin A trial, and then they heard about Anna Kutsudis' results and then decided to look at their data. And they also found, um, so if you look at the, the risks, the HIV transmission, they found a lower transmission amongst the exclusive breastfed group compared with the mixed-fed group. Um, 
The third one that was published was uh, Jerry Kovadia's uh, Labisa work, the Vertical Transmission Study. They also found that exclusive breastfeeding carried a lower risk of HIV transmission compared with mixed feeding. And what they also found is that if uh, mothers introduced solids early in the first 14 weeks of life, okay, so they mixed fed, but they mixed fed with solids, okay, so they, they were obviously doing partial breastfeeding because they were giving their babies food, okay. If they did that in the first 14 weeks of life, then that carried a higher risk of, an even higher risk of transmission, okay. And then the last study that was also published in 2007 was the Zambian Exclusive Breastfeeding Study. And they also found that exclusive breastfeeding carried a lower risk of HIV transmission compared with mixed breastfeeding or non-exclusive breastfeeding. So those were four studies that were uh, conducted between, well, conducted earlier, but published between 2001 and 2007. They all showed very similar results. Um, not all of them were set up to examine that question, which is why the results were questioned quite a lot. Um, but eventually, I think people started coming around to the idea that we may have to look at pattern of breastfeeding in relation to transmission. Okay. There have then been several other randomized trials and some observational studies looking at postnatal prophylaxis. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is the SWEN study, which is the six-week extended levirapine study, which was uh, conducted in Ethiopia, Uganda, and India. Um, so three countries, all women were breastfeeding. Um, and this is what it looked like. So um, there were two groups, it, because it was a randomized trial, there were two groups. The first group at the top, the moms got single-dose nevirapine, so I've just tried to put a tablet there. Um, and the babies just got single-dose nevirapine, okay? The second group, the moms got single-dose nevirapine, but the babies got six weeks of nevirapine, so every day for six weeks, okay? And what that showed is that um, in the intervention group, so the second group that got the six weeks of nevirapine, there was a 46% decrease in the six-week postnatal transmission rate. It also showed that there was improved six-month HIV-free survival. Okay, so we come back to this issue of HIV-free survival, and we see that at six months, the babies in the intervention group were not only free, more babies were not only free from HIV, but they had also survived, okay? Um, but what they found is that once the nevirapine was stopped at six weeks, transmission then started increasing again, okay? The next study is called the PEPI study, which was done in Malawi, also a randomized control trial in a breastfeeding population. And there were three groups here, okay? So the first group, in the first group at the top, uh, the moms got single-dose nevirapine, the babies got nevirapine, and one week of AZT. Transmission rate at nine months, so I've tried to illustrate it graphically, at nine months was 10.6% in that top group. In the second group, the intervention group, the mom got single-dose nevirapine, the babies got 14 weeks of nevirapine, and transmission rate in that group was 5.2%. In the third group, the moms got single-dose nevirapine, the babies got AZT and nevirapine every day for 14 weeks. I've just tried to put it in an orange color. It's not a primary color, mm -hmm. so it means it's a combination of two. <laughs> so they got AZT plus nevirapine for 14 weeks. So that's the difference between these two groups. Okay? And they found that transmission was about 6.4%. So there was not really a significant difference between these two groups, okay? But there was a significant difference, as you can see from the numbers, between the control group that only got the short, very short regimen, um, only single dose for mom, very short regimen for baby, and the 14-week uh, regimens. So these are randomized trials with postnatal prophylaxis to the baby, okay? But as the, the SWEN study found, um, once these regimens were stopped, there is an increased risk of transmission, okay? Because transmission simply continues. Then there's Keshebora. So now we're looking at studies with postnatal prophylaxis, but this is a little bit different. There were five studies, uh, five sites, located in Burkina Faso, Kenya, and South Africa. They took HIV-infected women with CD4 cell counts between 200 to 500, 
At that point in time, the cutoff for heart was uh, still 200, which is why they took 200 to 500, okay? Um, and all of them were breastfeeding. So I will show you the two groups. So there were two groups. Um, the first group got AZT from 28 weeks, single-dose nevirapine, and then the moms got tail cover. Okay, so they got AZT plus 3TC for one week. Okay? The babies got nevirapine, single-dose, plus one week of AZT. Okay? Transmission was about 2.2%. In the next group, these were randomized, remember, the moms actually got heart from 28 weeks. So you see heart for the moms. Sorry, the top is the moms and the <coughs> bottom is the baby. Okay, and this is supposed to be uh, the point of delivery. Okay, so that's the baby. Um, so the moms got heart and the babies got um, single dose nevirapine plus one week of AZT. And transmission was approximately 1.8%. So it looks fairly similar between the two groups. Okay. Um, but if you look at six month outcome between the two groups, um, the cumulative transmission at six months was about 8.5% in the babies who were in the, in the first group compared with 4.9% in the heart group, maternal heart now, okay? And that was significantly different, okay? And if one had to look purely at the postnatal infection rate, so these are cumulative, so they take into account the 2.2%. If one purely had to look at the postnatal transmission rate, um, it was 3.7% in the short course AZT arm, so the top arm, uh, versus 1.6% in the heart arm. Okay, so quite, and these were quite significantly different. Okay, so after the heart was discontinued, the rate of infection uh, was similar in both arms. Okay, but the main message from this study was that maternal heart arm or maternal heart was more efficacious than any short course regimen. Okay, so we've now seen results of studies that have used postnatal prophylaxis for babies, so that was the SWEN and the PEPI mainly, um, and then the Keshebora used maternal heart, okay? Then there are two more studies. Um, one is called Marbana, which was in Botswana, also a randomized trial, and the other one was the BAN study. Um, I won't go through Marbana in detail. The main message there was also that maternal heart regimens were efficacious in reducing postnatal transmission in mothers who had a CD4 cell count more than 200. So very similar to Keshebora. Um, but the BAN study is quite interesting because it's one of the, or it's the study upon which our South African regimen is now based. Um, yeah, which, uh, yeah, I'll come, I'll say something else just now. So the BAN study was conducted in Malawi. It was a randomized uh, controlled trial. They took women with CD4 cell counts, more than 250 cells at delivery, and no previous antenatal prophylaxis. So they had uh, three arms. The first arm was the control arm, where the mother was given single-dose nevirapine and one week of AZT3TC. The second arm, the mother was given single-dose nevirapine plus tail cover, um, plus a heart regimen from one week to six months postpartum. Okay, and the third arm was very similar to the f to the the control arm. It was the single dose nevirapine <coughs> plus uh, tail cover. Okay, so very similar. Well, uh, the tail cover is similar to our current regimen, but the single dose nevirapine is not because we now have a, a better regimen for the antenatal period. Okay, for the infants. Um, they basically had two, uh, two interventions. The control arm, which was purely the single-dose nevirapine uh, mothers with tail cover, their babies got the same. Single-dose nevirapine plus one week of 3TC, um, AZT. Um, and the other two intervention arms got daily infant nevirapine from one week to six months postpartum, which is very similar to our current regimen because we're giving daily nevirapine, okay? And what they found in the survey, or in the study, is that the cumulative probability of HIV infection at six months, so the probability of HIV infection at six months um, in infants who were not infected at birth, okay? So you're taking out those infants 
who may have been infected antenatally or during labor, and we're only concerning ourselves now with postnatal transmission, okay? Um, so in the control arm, so these mothers only got the single dose nevirapine plus tail cover, their infection rate was 6.4%, okay? In the arm where the mothers got maternal heart and the babies got daily nevirapine for six months, infection rate was 3%, okay? And in those mothers who got just the single dose nevirapine with the one week of AZT, and the babies got daily nevirapine for six months, their infection rate was 1.8%, okay? And that was significantly different from the 6.4%, okay? And so what they found is that maternal heart for six months and infant nevirapine for six months were effective in reducing transmission. Um, they were almost equally efficacious. One is sitting at 1.8%, the other is sitting at 3%, okay? But when statisticians went on to do further analysis, what they found is that it seems that there's a trend towards a better outcome with the infant nevirapine um, intervention, okay? Because the, the difference between the 3% and the 1.8%, if you look at it in statistics terms, was about 0.07%, uh, okay, which is almost significant, which is why um, many countries have gone for this regimen of using, many countries have gone for this regimen of using um, daily nevirapine. The only difference is that whereas these studies stopped at six months, what we're now saying is that use nevirapine throughout the breastfeeding period, okay? There, there has not been a study that has done that, so we don't know what the outcome is going to be. All we can do is post postulate to say that in the presence of a very good antenatal regimen, as we have now, uh, better than before, um, plus prophylaxis for infants, we can assume that our infection rates will decrease if mothers are breastfeeding. Um, and we assume that because the Pepe and the Swen studies showed that once you stop prophylaxis, transmission rates continue. So we're assuming that if you continue prophylaxis, we will keep the, the transmission rates at bay, okay? So that's where our regimen came from. Um, so I don't have too much time left, so I'm going to go through the rest of the slides fairly quickly and try and sum up. Um, so I think in summary, it's now established that we do have antiretroviral regimens that can be used postnatally to reduce HIV transmission through breastfeeding. Um, what about HIV-free survival um, and breastfeeding and regimens? There's not much information on HIV-free survival. Um, only one study, which was the, the SWEN study, showed that um, they had data on HIV-free survival. Uh, using uh, postnatal prophylaxis. Most of the other studies have not used postnatal prophylaxis, but um, in summary, the studies that we do have that have not used postnatal prophylaxis tend to show that even in the presence of um, avoidance of breastfeeding, um, whereas the initial um, infection rates might be lower in the HIV-exposed babies, once you measure outcome later on, so you might look at outcome at six weeks and see improved outcome in the, the formula feeding group or the group that has avo avoided breastfeeding, but once you follow them up to either 18 months or 24 months, the difference between the breastfeeding and the formula feeding group does not seem to still exist, okay? Which shows that the benefits then actually negate each other. Um, and this is what was proven or shown in Louise Kuhn's work, where um, the mortality caused by not breastfeeding actually cancelled out the HIV transmission prevented, okay? There's always been a thorny issue about uh, free formula milk in South Africa. Um, and I'm going to go through that quite quickly. I think the point to make is that the provision of free formula milk uh, increases the potential for but it doesn't guarantee uh, the use of formula and it doesn't guarantee exclusive formula feeding. Um, and I'm speaking about exclusive formula feeding now mainly from a child survival perspective and a child health perspective, not from a transmission perspective. Because obviously if you avoid all breastfeeding, 
you will be eliminating the risk of transmission through breast milk. But if you do formula feeding and introduce fruit from the age of three months, then you run into other child health uh, problems. Okay. Um, I want to run through the South African situation. And I think the main point to make here is that uh, what studies have shown is that if there is an inappropriate feeding choice that a mother makes, that increases the risk of HIV transmission or death. And it could be inappropriate breastfeeding choice or it could be an inappropriate formula feeding choice. So either way, uh, feeding choices or feeding practices need to be appropriate. This is a slide that um, shows how women actually breastfeed in South Africa or how HIV positive women feed. It's from three sites. Um, and I think the main point to make here is that whereas we say that those women who are avoiding breastfeeding should use a suitable breast milk substitute for the first six months, which is commercial infant formula, um, what we find is that these are the breastfeeding groups, the first two bars, and the two top bars are the formula feeding groups. Um, the mothers who were only feeding formula milk are in that uh, yellowish color. Okay, they were exclusively formula feeding. The rest of the mothers in the slightly bluish color, they're giving their babies um, fruit, um, mashed potato, chicken, uh, and cereals from the age of three months. Okay, so which from a child health perspective is not a good practice. Okay. Um, and this is a slide, I don't expect you to read this, but um, I think in South Africa, we've reached a situation now where we need to assess where we are in terms of feeding. Um, and there has been technical working group set up um, to see whether South Africa can make a particular decision as a country to say what feeding uh, modality would be most appropriate for the majority of the population and for the HIV infected population. And this slide, the red on this slide kind of shows that in every province, there is something that we're worried about in terms of either under five mortality rate, infant mortality rate, um, child poverty, um, access to cotrimoxazole, access to vaccinations, uh, access to clean water. And it's on the basis of this that South Africa will have to make a decision about whether to go um, to promote either breastfeeding or formula or avoiding breastfeeding as a country for HIV infected women, so at a public health level. I'm going to skip the details about the WHO guidelines. Um, just to mention that there have been new WHO guidelines that have come out. And essentially what they say is that national or subnational health authorities should decide whether health services will, will principally counsel and support mothers known to be HIV positive to breastfeed and receive ARV interventions or to avoid breastfeeding. Which comes back to the point I was making just now to say as a country, um, at some level, uh, policymakers will have to soon decide whether we are a breastfeeding country and will promote breastfeeding for the general population, including the HIV positive women or formula feeding for HIV positive women. So I think that was a lot of information. Um, and I'm not sure yeah, whether it's, you've been able to digest all of it. <laughs>